on this episode of China Unscripted, how the CCP is getting cozy with Iran. But the honeymoon might now be over. Plus, why Taiwan needs the U.S. to stay in the Middle East. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And joining us today is Jonathan Crystal. He's a professor of international affairs at Yeshiva University in New York City, and he's written about the Middle East and East Asia for publications including ARC Digital, CNN, Mike, and World Policy Journal. Jonathan, thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. I'm happy to be here. So, I mean, this this is this is very interesting to me. You know, uh, the U.S. obviously treats Iran as a pretty big threat. You know, they 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 have threatened to nuke. Israel, the U.S. has put pretty stringent sanctions on Iran, but the Chinese Communist Party continues to do a lot of business with Iran. What's what's going? Why are why are they doing that? Well, what China? Well, I think what they're doing it largely by necessity to some degree, and they're doing it because ultimately their interests are different than ours, and um, it also provides a way to to stick it to us and to the West. But China is heavily reliant, almost entirely reliant in terms of exports on um, oil from Russia and the Middle East. And you know the Russia part is a, a whole other story, I'm sure, for for many podcasts, many recordings. But you know it needs the supply of oil from the Persian Gulf, and it does not have an interest in bringing down the full wrath of the United States, right? It doesn't want to trigger uh, secondary sanctions by um, using U.S. dollars to buy oil, but all the ways that that can happen, which we can get into to if you like, but they still sort of need the, need the oil. And so they've reached an arrangement with the Iranian regime by which they can secure a significant amount of oil, and it's, it's more than doubled in about the last 14 months, um, without triggering U.S. sanctions through a sort of barter system, whereby um, China trades all of these goods, mostly sort of cheap manufacturing goods, uh, to Iran, and in exchange, they get uh, Iranian oil at what, and it's you know, sort of hard to value this way, but at essentially below market price. And so it, it certainly is a nice bonus for Beijing that this sort of um, further brings together the sort of axis of autocracies in China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. But what's really driving it is the, the need for oil. And that same need also makes it very difficult for. China to get as close to Iran as, as Iran wants, and probably as, as China wants as well, um, because you know Iran is not the only source of oil, and they cannot depend entirely on Iranian oil. Um, so there's a lot, a lot, uh, I think a lot going on there. So I have a question about this barter system. So normally, globally, oil is paid for in US dollars, even between non-US countries, right? But Iran doesn't want China's renminbi, right? Because they can't they can't spend it on anything other than Chinese goods anyway. So they're getting all this cheap stuff. Um, but even though that maybe technically, because it's a barter thing, doesn't uh, violate sanctions, but like it in the spirit of violating sanctions, right? I mean, like like it's kind of the same thing, isn't it? I mean, doesn't the, shouldn't the U.S. see it that way? Oh, for sure. I mean, look, it absolutely violates the spirit of the sanctions. I think there's no question about it. Whether it violates the letter of the sanctions, frankly, is, is a bit unclear. And I think that the CCP capitalizes both on that lack of clarity and on the fact that they realize, and so far, I think, correctly, they, I mean, I think the evidence shows correctly, realize that the U.S. is not going... Um, to react um, in a dramatic or significant way to that trade. And so, and I think that there are a few reasons for it. I think we can't overlook the fact that to a certain degree, you know, and I think this is, a, I might have a different 
order of policy preferences, but to a certain degree, this actually benefits the U.S. consumer. Because if that oil were entirely off the market, which it is supposed to be, right? But if it were, that would mean that China would have to source about 1.2 million barrels of oil a day from other sources, sources that us and our allies also rely on, and that would drive up the cost for the U.S. consumer. So I think it is, you know, I think it's a tricky sort of game for Washington to play. I don't always agree with the way they do it, nor do I always disagree. But I think there's no question that that it, it goes against at least the spirit of the sanctions. Well, I guess, like, on that point, it's the same thing with uh, the sanctions on Russia, how, you know, you, you can't sell weapons to the to the Russian army, but if a Chinese company gives a Russian company weapons, then that, that's okay. It, or it's almost like if we we're sanctioning Russia, right, and then Germany, like, trades bullets and body armor for natural gas or something, right? Well, like, I mean, like I'm, I'm not, that's not actually it's, happening. It's but like a little as, less as a, direct in a well, certain sense because Iran's not, like the US is not like fighting Iran. Right, but I mean, it's still like using a barter to completely violate the intention of the sanctions. That's right, but of course the other difference between the example that you give is that in this case, both Iran and China are US adversaries. And so they both have an incentive to make this situation work in some sense on its merits um, for both sides. Uh, and they have a shared interest in um, having some sort of negative impact on the US and our regional and global allies and partners in a way that a situation like Germany and Russia wouldn't, um, where it's a little bit more delicate. This, you know, Iran would like this to be much more overt. They certainly would be more than thrilled to get payment in US dollars. Um, but it's China that is a bit more cautious because you know they are trying to push the limits as far as they can without, without crossing a line that forces the US to react in some way. And in particular, what they want to avoid are US secondary sanctions on the major Chinese banks. And, uh, and, and because ultimately, the US is a, uh, ultimately, and in my personal view, I would say a bit un unfortunately, um, the US is a significantly bigger market for China. And so, yeah, they want to do business with Iran, they want Iranian oil, they want to undermine the US position in the Persian Gulf, but they also like our money. I like our money too. Yeah, and we have a lot more money than does Iran. So one thing you mentioned earlier, just, just to add to, to make matters worse, what you said is true um, or has been true um, up until uh, this past summer, right? Where up until this summer, the only way you could buy oil on the global market was in US dollars. But for the first time, um, I forget the exact day, both uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE um, have uh, Saudi Arabia has indicated willingness to accept payment in RMB, and UAE actually has accepted payment for oil in RMB. And that is um, a very small fraction, I mean, I, I almost so small it's almost hard to measure in terms of the global oil trade, but it did kind of shatter um, a long standing global precedent that, and I think we haven't. Uh, I don't think that's bro broken through in public awareness, and I think in part because there's a lot of other things going on, um, but certainly has potential long-term consequences. So what is the what is the incentive for the UAE and Saudi Arabia to accept Chinese yuan? Because obviously the CCP loves that they would take it, but what is the incentive on the other side? You know, on the, uh, I, I could venture a guess. I mean, I think that that's, that's a big question. Um, in terms of trying to get inside the heads of what the Emiratis and the Saudis are thinking here. Because they're also, uh, in particular the Emiratis, um, trying to play all sides um, you know, as, as best they can. What I would, and, th and this is an educated guess, I don't know this for certain, I would assume that they are getting a better deal, right? That, that they are getting above market value in RMB, and that those countries see a value in 
you know, having um, some level of their own reserves held in RMB, and thus, um, and thus it probably works out okay for both sides. I mean, the Emiratis and the Saudis have not sort of opened the floodgates to that sort of thing, because again, I think even though they are, you know, partners of the U.S., not formal allies, they are trying to see how far they can push things as well, um, both with China and Russia. What do you think the ultimate impact of that will be? I mean, I don't know. It's sounding like we need, we might need another war for oil. Well, I don't think, I mean, I, I don't, thankfully, I don't think that's going to be in the cards um, of war for oil. I, in part, that's, due to lack of appetite in the U.S., but also we are not reliant on the Middle East for our own oil supply, right? We are reliant on it to keep the global price down and to not cause tremendous economic harm inside the U.S. But, you know, we're going to have access to oil pretty much no matter what. And the U.S. has been, we do import some oil, but we have been uh, almost entirely energy independent since around 2015. Um, and so this is really, for us, it's about keeping the price down, not so much about access. And so we're not going to, I, I think the American public even would be much more willing to tolerate higher prices and not a, a war for oil than they would, um, you know, a, a, a war in the Middle East. But doesn't, in terms of the global oil price, doesn't OPEC essentially set the price like they collude to set the price in a way that would be illegal if it was like companies in the US but when it's OPEC and it's international they can essentially price fix which means that it's not entirely dependent on the supply and demand but rather what they think they can get away with charging this is true but it's less true than it used to be and that's primarily for a couple of for two reasons one is the ability of the U.S. and other major consumers, including China, to produce a tremendous amount of their own energy. It's just that both China and the U.S., well, not so much the U.S., but China needs so much more than it can produce. Um, but still, the ability um, uh, to produce more ha has gone up. And, the, um, and for OPEC to function that way, it also requires those states to get along <laughs> and to like reach agreements on how to do that. And, and that does happen, but it doesn't always happen. Is there tension in the Middle East? <laughs> tension in the Middle East. Who ever heard of such a thing? I know. Um, so, well, so a big part of this is that China does not sort of have the oil reserves that the United States does. That, that's right. I, I'm not even, not even close. They have to go abroad. You mentioned that China has doubled their intake of Iranian oil in the last 14 months. Is that a demand issue that they need a lot more oil now, or are they rebalancing where they get their oil from? That's a really good question. So what I can say is it's not the latter. Uh, at least, I mean, that, that might be come up just because it does, but that, that's not the driver. I, I think it's about again, seeing what they can get away with, right? This also, the, the more China is able to import, it also drives down prices for them. First of all, they still need to acquire more sources of energy as a hedge, right? The U.S. has been trying to get our regional partners to not sign long-term commitments with the CCP. And the CCP has to be worried, uh, although, you know, Frankly, they don't have to worry about this uh, as much as I might like them to. But still, thinking long term, the responsible thing for them is to say, well, what are sources of oil or natural gas? I'm just sort of conflating the two, but I think for our purposes that, that works. Um, what are sources that the U.S. can't mess with? Like Iran is not going to be responsive or receptive to just a U.S. nice request for them to not do this, right? And so by building up this relationship and um, importing more and more, and you know, it's, it's a significant increase, but in terms of China's total needs, 
it's not a huge percentage yet. Um, but I think that they've been doing this gradually again to see what they can, to see how it works. And it might be working for China actually a lot more than it's working for Iran. And so I don't think we're going to see this trajectory continue. And that's not through any sort of, you know, marvelous policy decision by the United States or anyone else. It's just a function of the internal dynamics in Iran and the broader Iran-China relationship. Well, I wonder if there's anything more to it than just the oil. Because as you mentioned earlier, there are other sources of oil besides Iran. Uh, I know earlier this year, uh, Xi Jinping invited the leader of Iran uh, to China. Is, is there something else going on in the relationship besides just oil and the source of oil that the United States essentially can't touch? Oh, well, for sure. I mean, I think all of these things are interconnected. But what you also have going on in general in the Persian Gulf region, in the broader Middle East as well, or the MENA region, but especially in the Persian Gulf, you have had over the last um, three U.S. administrations, uh, inclusive of the current, um, U.S. presidents who have talked about um, U.S. pulling back from this region and, you know, and pivoting to Asia or whatever you want to say. Now, I think that most of that has been all talk, although I do think that some of the desire is genuine. But we haven't actually done that much. But I do think that the CCP sees a potential opening there, I, I think correctly, sees a potential opening there whereby the U.S. pulls back either in a physical sense, in an investment sense, in a political capital sense, and they are much better placed than Russia is to fill in that gap. I don't think that they are at the point where they could fully replace the U.S. in the region even just from a you know maritime security sense. I'm not even sure, frankly, they would even want to do that yet. But you do have, I think, a broader competition in this region that sort of is an undercurrent of a lot of different diplomatic maneuvering and commercial maneuvering um, between the U.S. and China. Do you think that what China... What does the CCP kind of envision when they think of replacing the U.S. in the region? Are they thinking mostly economically, or are they thinking that politically they want to become more of an influence in the Middle East? Because the U.S. has been pretty enmeshed in that region for decades now. Um, but like the, some of the, I, I guess, conventional wisdom about China or the CCP is that they wouldn't want to get involved in like the local politics of the Middle East, like that they would just be interested in making money off the Middle East. Is that true in your in your point of view? Yeah, I think that that is actually largely true, but I would add a, a third factor. So if we let's um, kind of zoom in as we go. I think on the, the economic factor, that is absolutely the sort of step one. I mean, they definitely have been encouraging investment from every state in the region, right? And that's an almost uniquely... You know, it, it's they're one of the few countries I think that that can do that. You know, to try to encourage investment from and in you know, Iran, the GCC, Israel, right? Every country in the region they are making this sort of play in different ways. Um, and I think that for a long time, up until really just a few years ago, they were pretty content with that, or at least were establishing a, a foothold in that way. I think that what they, the shift has been, it's not really a shift, but they've added in a sort of interest in regional politics, re regional politics between states, right? We've seen them take a role in negotiating uh, normalization between Iran and Saudi Arabia, it, that, that probably most prominently that. So they have taken an interest in some of the politics of the region. What they still have tried to avoid and I think that probably in the long run is going to be difficult for them to avoid, and, and, and we already see this, I think, especially in Iran, is being involved in the local politics. They have absolutely tried to stay out of it, right? That's, that's been their thing. I think it's fairly well known. The Syrian civil war is really the most 
um, the best example of this, right? At one point in that war, there were over 50 different named armed groups backed by different combinations of states. None of those states was China, right? Like China did not back any of those actors in this little sort of miniature world war. And the reason for that, and the reason why they appointed a special envoy for Syria was that they would be the one state that didn't upset anybody. They weren't fighting anybody. They didn't back anyone that anyone hated. And thus, no matter what happened or will happen, since that war is a lot smaller, fewer players, but it's still ongoing, they would be in the best place to essentially rebuild Syria afterwards. Um, and so they sort of stayed out of that. But that's becoming, I think, more and more difficult. And I think part of that uh, is just sort of the nature of politics in general. As their investments increase, as their interests in the region increase, they can't really entirely avoid it. Um, and it, it could just be that it coincides with my own um, expertise. But in, in Iran, you see how it's the domestic politics that is, I think, the greatest obstacle to a, a much closer relationship between those two, much more than anything the U.S. could do. So on the domestic politics front, so uh, how is this massive like oil for Chinese manufactured goods trade uh, affecting locals and local politics in Iran? So this is what's, what's sort of interesting. And if you think about it, it, it shouldn't really have taken anyone by surprise, and yet it seems to have taken um, Tehran a bit by surprise. So the impact, as, as one might expect, you have a flood of cheap Chinese goods coming in to Iran and driving down the price of local manufacturing and putting domestic producers out of business. And that's impactful anywhere, right? We, this, is a, a, this comes up in U.S. politics. But Iran, especially, because of the longevity of U.S. and international sanctions, it has promoted right, the resistance economy, which essentially is government policies that promote domestic arms manufacturing, domestic heavy machinery manufacturing, all types of domestic manufacturing, you know, from computer products to whatever, because they couldn't get those products in the open market. Well... So now you have a society that has a lot of domestic producers, um, people working on assembly lines, things like that. And now you have this flood of cheap Chinese goods coming in and it drives them out of business. And now you have a whole lot of people out of work and they might not be anti-regime, right? The U.S. has this uh, tendency to underestimate regime support among all of our adversaries. That's not to say that it's super high. I just think we underestimate it. And this is something that even supporters of the Islamic Republic are affected by and have, in fact, taken to the streets over, right? You've had street protests over the years, anti-Chinese street protests, where you have people holding signs that say, Supreme Leader, don't sell us to China, don't give our jobs to China, um, slogans like that. And because it is not easily painted, as sort of the work of the U.S., as the work of Israel, that there's some nefarious force behind these protests, it's been a bit hard for the regime to ignore. And I think they're still trying to figure out how they can encourage the relationship between Beijing and Tehran without upsetting their own base of political support. You know, I wonder if this is part of the reason why the U.S. hasn't uh, been too strict about China kind of violating the spirit of these sanctions, because they see it as potentially being destabilizing for the Iranian regime. I think that is a, a very good observation. I don't, I'm not in a position to know that that is what our intent is with certainty, but it certainly is a benefit. I think the question will be for the U.S. is, at what point, if any, does the economic benefit that either side might accrue or on the Iranian side in terms of, of weapons and things like that, at what point might that outweigh the domestic unrest that this relationship might cause? And we're not there yet. Maybe we'll never get there. But, but that is something I think that I'm quite sure um, people 
in, in Washington pay attention to. And I'm wondering, outside of just um, this sort of economic resentment that, that the people of Iran, Iran might be having to, towards China, not just Iran, but all of the Middle East, I mean, China is not known for treating Muslims particularly well. So how how do these countries feel about working with a regime that is committing ethnic cleansing on the Uyghur Muslims? This is always, I, I think, uh, a mystery to a lot of Western observers, and rightly so. But I think there are a couple of, of explanations for it. The most straightforward explanation, and this applies actually much less in Iran than it does in Saudi Arabia and much of the GCC, though not all, well, mostly all except for uh, Qatar. But because those states actually have such uh, tight control over their own local media, combined with the fact that even though you're in Saudi Arabia, you can get CNN, right? But how often it does, you know, they do mention the Uyghur on CNN, but it's not like, it's not on all the time, right? It's not, even if you watch CNN day and night, you're not going to see that much about it. And so in some ways, it's actually due to control of the information environment in the Gulf. I mean, that explains why the people don't get so upset and put this sort of pressure on their own government. But what that doesn't explain is why the people in government themselves um, are okay with it or, or are are. I don't want to say okay, but are have at least uh, tacit acquiescence, right? And I think that that does vary between states. In the case of Iran, that has also caused domestic tension, in part because part of Iran's stated from the beginning, from 1979 on, one of their stated uh, purposes of the revolution is first um, protection of Shias. But second, protection of, of the oppressed um, and Muslims everywhere. And this certainly falls under that second one. Well, the, the Iranian people are uh, mostly Shia, but the Uyghur Muslims, those who still practice in, in uh, Western China, are predominantly Sunni. Right, but it's still the second sort of tier. And it's still like, it is still part of their stated purpose, right? That it, if the choice is Shia or Sunni, it's going to go with Shia. But otherwise, like it, it is incongruous with many of their other positions. And, and because of that, there is not unanimity among the Iranian cabinet, among the Iranian clerical establishment. There is also not unanimity about the relationship with the CCP either. And, and in that case, because you're talking about people who like, Frankly, they're going to get their money no matter what. It's not about the manufacturing for them. But there are some people, especially in the clerical establishment, for whom they take these things seriously. Like, it's not just uh, about, I don't know, domestic politics. It's not just about geopolitics at all. They really have a strong belief that they should be assisting oppressed Muslim communities. And thus, this also creates tension in, I mean, I don't know if I could say I have insight into the supreme leader's inner circle, but again, into the, the clerical establishment that has been largely co-opted by the supreme leader, this is one of the few real signs of, of tension. Whereas in the GCC, you know, in a country like Saudi Arabia, MBS exerts such total control over the government and the media, you know, and, and the people that he can silence opposition. It's not that Iran doesn't do that, but he can do it in a much less public way. And he can keep reporting about this away from the, the broader population. But it, it, so it is an absolute incongruity. It is in some ways, it seems sort of inexplicable, but when you look at what the people in the region, the media that they consume and what they report, it makes at least a little bit more sense, I guess. Well, another incongruity that this is this is a great mystery to me of China's interaction with the Middle East is, you know, Iran has said they want to wipe Israel off the map. 
China is somehow able to do business with all of the countries of the Middle East, including Israel. How does that work? Yeah, it's it's another really good question. And I think if we look at this from um, a couple of, of different capitals, I think it plays differently. So inside Iran, this also, in my in my opinion, is probably... You know, I don't think any one of these things would sort of shatter the 25-year um, comprehensive strategic partnership that uh, we're about a couple, two years into right now between Iran and, and China. But it is something that people in the government and the population are aware of. You know, and there's this view, why are we becoming so close with this country that is making these strategic investments in Israel? Um, and you know, are actually even more so in the GCC. There is a lot more, um, it's not huge, but a lot more um, person-to-person exchange, educational exchange between China and the GCC and China and Israel than there is between China and Iran. There, um, and the size of the economies of the GCC and Israel is significantly bigger than in Iran. And so inside Iran, you have some people as well, who are some constituencies who are like, okay, I understand the necessity of, of this relationship in the moment, but if push comes to shove, if there is some sort of regional conflict, China is not going to be on our side. Just as we assume, and I think historically, probably correctly, they have as well, that China's sort of in it for the money. And thus, or at least that's priority one. And they figure... China is going to stay out of it, or if anything, they would be more likely to assist the GCC because they get more oil from Saudi Arabia alone than they do from Iran, and they're larger markets. And so that also you know, makes people a little bit wary. Inside, now the Chinese relationship with the GCC, and, with, and especially with Israel, is a bit trickier. Because sort of question is what, you know, not, our power has limits, right? I mean, our military power, our economic power, our, our political capital, it has limits. I don't think, you know, we can assume that we can be able to do everything. But is it, do I think we could do, could have put or continue to put much more pressure on Israel over doing business with the CCP than we do? Absolutely, right? China owns or has a long-term contract to operate Haifa port. Um, they are also uh, constructing a new port in Ashdod. This would be like the two major ports in Israel. They, uh, Israeli law, um, which is written to a large, in this regard, about uh, Chinese investment designed a bit to placate the US, but it exempts trade in high tech, right? So there are very few limits on what Israeli high tech firms, including firms you know, that, that clearly have dual use, produce dual use technology, like China, it's not just that they sell things to China, it's that China invests in those companies. Like the CCP sub, essentially subsidiaries are part owners. And Uh, this is something that I think I, I, I think we could do more about. I think it's something that we would actually do more about if there was greater awareness of it in the United States. And what I am not saying is that we should shatter the U.S.-Israel relationship over it. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is one of the benefits of the close relationship that we have with Israel including in these same regards, and weapons and high-tech trade and stuff like that, that we should actually leverage that. And I think we could probably leverage that um, and get Chinese investment, at least in these industries, out. And it does not seem to me that we've even started down that road. And, and that's just the Israel case. Um, there's also the underlying, um, well, well, one other connected to Israel, 
You also have a lot of talk um, in the media. I was at a, a symposium all day at the Council on Foreign Relations yesterday that spent a lot of time talking about the possibility of Saudi-Israeli normalization in exchange for a U.S. defense treaty, mutual defense treaty with Saudi Arabia. And the, I think, near universal assumption is that this is, in addition to being driven a bit by domestic politics here, that this is driven by an attempt to get the Saudis to stop doing, um, to stop buying weapons from China to increase oil capacity, that, that it's done to disrupt that relationship. That one I'm a little bit skeptical about. I, I'm not skeptical that that's the intent. I do think that is driving part of it. I'm just skeptical that it will have that impact. I'm not sure that MBS is, I don't think he has Washington's best interest at heart, let's say. I'm I mean, I think that makes sense in terms of Saudi Arabia and China and how Saudi Arabia would try to essentially like play both the US and China. From the Israel angle, are they not concerned about the high tech situation, the dual use capabilities? And sure, maybe Israel doesn't think that the CCP would directly threaten Israel, but if China and Iran get closer, that's not a concern for them? I think it is a calculated risk and the perception of that is that that is a much, much, much more hypothetical, very long-term possibility. I think what you said is exactly right. I don't think Israel sees, I think Israel's correct in not seeing China as a, any sort of military threat to them for the foreseeable future, nor do I think that they think anything to do with the Iran-China relationship would have a real impact on a hypothetical Iranian-Israeli all-out war because Israel has a nuclear deterrent anyway. And I think that there is probably correctly a lot of confidence in that. That And they know, just as I said, I mean, they know even better than I do that China makes a much more money and gets access to much better technology through the relationship with Israel and even the GCC than they are going to with Iran. Um, and so I agree in principle that that should be something that there's greater concern about. I actually think that that's something that if there was greater um, domestic pushback in Israel about, that you might see a change there. Um, but you know, there's a lot going on in Israeli domestic politics, and like this is not anywhere near the top of anyone's uh, priority list. But but it could become so if the domestic political situation stabilizes. It seems that the CCP is really the one that's getting all the advantage from these relationships. I mean, yeah, they are they are balancing Iran, Israel, Saudi Arabia. They. They're better at handling the Middle East than the U.S. ever was. Yeah. Well, I think part of that is that they're the new guys, hmm. right? Like, they're, they're the new guys. Part of what has enabled China to be able to have decent working relationships with every state in the region um, is that there's no historical memory of Chinese imperialism in the, in the region. There's no memory of recent occupation, of recent conflict, right? The, the Uyghur issue is really the only thing that strikes any sort of chord like that, where you have any sort of domestic constituency that's like, well, China, I don't know, um, right? But, but otherwise, everyone else, every other outside power, comes with some sort of baggage. And so in some sense, there's a new guys and they just haven't had enough time to either make enemies. You know, the new guy, new kid at school shows up on, on day one. Does everyone immediately hate them? Does everyone- Yes, they're, they're new, they're weak. <laughs> well, they're always the new guy, but I'm not 
you know, but over time, if they end up being jerks, you know, the relationships change. They also haven't had enough time to really mess things up the way we have in many ways. And so I think that they benefit from that, but I, I think that they will learn. I do not think that the CCP is any more capable than we are of playing some sort of diplomatic or political role in the region. I think that they're probably, in the long run, a lot less capable. But, but they, are in, they are in a good position at the moment for that. But we sort of enable that as well. Because China, and not only China, and I realize I'm using China and the CCP interchangeably, but sometimes they are interchangeable, but mostly we're talking about the, the CCP. They, like many other states, you know, essentially free ride off of the U.S. naval presence in the Persian Gulf. And it's, it's, a, it's a problem for the U.S., but it's a tricky one, because what is the alternative, in a sense, if we actually pull back from the region and China feels like it has to be the guarantor of, of trade um, through uh, um, the Straits of Hormuz and the Bab al-Mandab, um, I guess in this case more the Straits of Hormuz, is that better for us? Like, I, I don't think we want the CCP to, in some sense, have veto power over traffic Assuming they could even manage. I mean, this is something that we talk about in the Pacific. We don't want them to control trade in the South China Sea, right? So it's, I imagine, the same issue here. Quite right. They, they don't. They don't have that capacity at the moment um, in the Gulf. That's quite right. They they couldn't do it if they wanted to. But what if they wanted to, or what if they needed to? And right, as, as you said, we, we don't want them to anywhere. Yeah, because they would they would do the same thing as we do, except in an evil way. Yeah, I mean, uh, I can hear the comment section exploding. Well, I, right I mean, like they, because the, the the U.S. is like stopping pirates essentially from disrupting trade and that sort of thing, ensuring free trade regardless of who the players are. But China would be biased towards some players and against other players uh, in a way that the U.S. is not. You can leave the evil. You can even leave the evil part out of it. Their interests are their own, and their interests are very different not only from our interests, but from, I think, most of the world's interests. And exactly as you say, they could, for whatever reason, and that reason could be economic, could be poli purely political. For whatever reason, do we want them to be in a position even of slowing down the traffic out of the Gulf, um, which would hurt the U.S. economy? Um, I don't think we do. Thankfully, they are not able to do it if they wanted to. But the other, the flip side of that is it means they don't, they are not seen as having a heavy hand, you know, other than that sort of in Iran, because of these issues we've spoken about, they're not seen as having some sort of heavy hand in the region. People don't encounter, um, you know, the PLA or the PLN. Um, they have done joint exercises, but I mean on a sort of daily basis, right? They're not in anyone's face about it, and so they don't provoke any sort of negative reaction. But over time, that, you could see how that could easily change. So I think that, that, you know, again, as their presence there increases, and both in, in scope and in time, um, that that would change for any state, and I think especially um, especially for China. Well, this is an interesting strategic thing you, you you bring up. Like you mentioned, for all the reasons you just mentioned, China benefits from the U.S. maintaining a stabilizing presence in the Middle East. It also benefits from the fact that a big part of the U.S. military is in the Gulf and not in the Asia Pacific, especially around Taiwan. Yeah, I think that that is fair. But again, it's one of these, you know, it's a very delicate balance for, for the U.S. Because if, if you think about a Taiwan contingency and the need to resupply Taiwan, right, that's not going to be purely about weapons or money, right? That, that also will probably require energy. And um, we also have prepositioned 
ammunition stockpiles and weapon stockpiles in the Middle East, uh, some of which was drawn down just yesterday to provide uh, to Ukraine. Um, and so, you know, even in that case, I think we still need to have a naval presence there in part to shore up a defense of Taiwan. Um, I'm sure you could quibble about the numbers. What do you really need to do that? Like, certainly, I think you could have those arguments. I don't know if I'm the best, best person to have a, a strong position one way or the other on the details of it. But I think even in the case of uh, a war in East Asia or South China Sea or around Taiwan or any sort of real conflagration, that there actually might even be greater value at that moment to the naval presence in the Gulf than there is literally like today. I guess if China is getting most of its oil from the Middle East and they can't get it from their own country. Right. Because the other thing that we could do, in addition to supplying oil and gas to Taiwan, is we could do what we were just saying we'd be worried China would do. Except in this case, we're talking about in, in the instance of Chinese aggression. Right. We could, in that instance, slow down the transit of oil out of the Gulf. And that could have a tremendous impact on the PLN as well in that case. And so I think that we, I think it's one of many reasons why I always get a bit nervous when US presidents and major figures, political figures, talk about pulling back from the Middle East. Um, I'm, I don't panic about it because I don't believe that they'll do it, but uh, I still get a bit nervous about it because I think we have broader interests than just protecting the, I, I just think it's a more complicated issue than it's made out to be. It's always more complex than like the stump speech on like the presidential campaign. Yeah, yeah. quite right. I, I mean, well, what president wants to, or what candidate wants to say, look, I know that a lot of the countries in the Middle East are authoritarian regimes, but it's really important for us to be there to be a counterbalance to China, right? Like how is it a US domestic voter base going to respond to something like that? I mean, I think at, at best, they'll change the channel. <laughs> um, well, it, it does sound like what you're saying is that China is kind of in a honeymoon period with much of the these Middle Eastern countries. But like we've seen that honeymoon period like kind of end in places they've been in longer. Like Sri even, Lanka? Even like with their Belt economic, Road, yes. Africa. Like yeah. Belt and Road, Africa is, is becoming a problem. A lot of like the Southeast Asian countries. Um, so, I mean, I would expect the same thing to kind of happen in the Middle East if they're there long enough and they don't change their MO. Absolutely. And... I would say that in the Iran case, we're past the honeymoon period. We're at like the first big couple's fight, or really probably the third or fourth big couple's fight, where like both sides are like, did I do the right thing here? Did I make a mistake? Um, I'm rethinking it. And I think that we are um, probably towards the end of the honeymoon period um, elsewhere, but, but still in that. Um, so yeah, I, I think that that's, uh, but that's right. What is this couples fight situation going on right now between Iran and China? Well, well I, you know, what we were talking about earlier, you have, um, in addition to the economic issues, um, in terms of that domestic production that, that we, we spoke about before, that's a big issue, number one. I think the second big issue um, is uh, about Chinese surveillance, uh, Chinese surveillance technology. Right, that one thing that um, they have done is China has sold some of their facial recognition software, essentially like the tools of oppression. They have really over the last year and a half, like since this strategic partnership, sold this, actually not really sold, traded this technology to Tehran and been working with them on how to use it. And this was put into practice uh, in the really the last six or eight months um, in 
the course of some of the large protests we've seen about women's rights and hijab and other issues, where what one way that Iran was able to temporarily, because that might be starting back up now, um, dampen that was they use that technology to identify protesters during protests and then not kill them in the middle of the day, in the middle of a protest, on camera, they do something and then it brings out way more people and stuff like that. So they use this stuff, they figure out who they are and they come visit them later at home at night. Don't do anything there either. They don't need to and just be like, look, we know who you are. If you go out again, who knows what could happen? Right, something like that, and are able to use that to scare people off the streets in a more subtle way than just gunning people down with. But the people realize they know this is going on, right? That this is not some sort of secret. Iranian media reports about this. They don't necessarily report it as a bad thing, but it's you know it is not it's not some sort of state secret in Tehran. And so the population, although not the regime supporters in this case, but the population now that may not have had any opinion about China at all before, sees it as complicit in their own oppression. And that population is significant, possibly a greater um, number than, uh, of, of, than there are of regime supporters. And, you know, that that also causes uh, causes tension as well. Um, we also mentioned the economic issues and the perception that China might side with the CCC or Israel. Um, and this is something that mo the case that comes to mind where Iran was forced to remove a benefit to China that it had already agreed to was a, uh, about two and, a, two and a half years ago um, you had rolling brownouts inside Iran, which is a little weird because it's a major energy producer. And those brownouts also drove people out into the streets. But, but what that was covered in the Western media a little bit. But what was the reason for the brownouts was that Iran had agreed to allow Chinese Bitcoin miners. They had given them heavily subsidized, I mean, and that's an understatement, um, access to energy on the Iranian power grid. And uh, Chinese Bitcoin operators or Bitcoin mining operations set up a very large scale and were just draining massive amounts of power out of the Iranian power grid and causing brownouts in all, all over the place. And that's a case that people then take to the streets, talking about this, citing this as the reason. And what happened, again, in part because these are not necessarily opponents of the regime, they're just people who you know, want their lights on, um, the regime backed down. And they ended energy subsidies, or you know, uh, local energy subsidies, to Chinese firms. And you know, you can, just that alone is evidence that the Supreme Leader and the regime in Tehran are aware that this is not all, you know, hugs and kisses and everyone's getting along so well that there are actual domestic costs to this relationship. Um, and so far, they're willing to pay most of those costs, but not all of them. And the trend is, the trend is in the right direction, I think, from our perspective, not not from their perspective. Well, in the case of Bitcoin miners, that's not something that this then the Iranian regime had to go back on something they promised the CCP directly, right? Because Bitcoin miners aren't like the Chinese state. It wasn't the agreement wasn't Bitcoin miners can do this, but it was. Chinese firms as a way to encourage investment by Chinese firms in Iran that their essentially their electricity bill would be and you know, I'm, I'm going to be slightly off on the numbers at least like 1 20th the normal bill I, I bet you, that might not be exactly right but you, that is about the scale of it 
So right, it didn't necessarily have to be Bitcoin, it could be any Chinese uh, investment. But what ended up happening was that it encouraged these Bitcoin miners to move operations there to take advantage of that. And that forced the sort of this pushback. Um, so you're right, yeah, so there's not an agreement about Bitcoin per se at all. It's just that that's how this manifested when it was put into place. But in terms of like, was that a big blow to the CCP? Like, were they very upset about it? I don't think so. But, and so, you know, I, it's not that I read so much into that instance on its face, but as a, to me, what was notable about that was the Iranian government's responsiveness to the public's concern uh, about the relationship, in part because the protests against it were specifically directed against, those protests were specifically directed against the Iran-China relationship and not, and less so about, you know, corruption. I'm not making light of corruption, but I mean, less broadly focused sort of thing. I mean, the, that China was sort of the target, right? That we don't want this relationship to continue. And that hasn't ended the relationship at all. But it has forced the regime to take, kind of keep that in mind um, in a way that they may not, I'm, I'm fairly confident they did not anticipate. In part because they may not have anticipated, you know, this particular scenario or any particular scenario. But, um, and I think that that because some of these other issues are not going to be as easily solved, but are going to have to be worked through, but are going to be, are being grappled with in Iran and will continue to be grappled with in Iran. It is not, I do not think we should assume that the Iran-China relationship will continue to get closer and closer. I think that we're probably slightly past the peak of that relationship. Um, but only slightly. So this 25-year strategic comprehensive partnership that the two countries have, we're two years in, two and a half years in, uh, how much longer do you think that'll last? I think I would be pretty surprised if it lasted even five years from now. I think I think it is, I, let's, let me rephrase that slightly. Do I think they're going to take the piece of paper and rip it to shreds and publicly say, this is over in that shorter time frame or shorter? Probably not. Um, although I'm always hesitant to make predictions that far out, who knows what could happen. But do I think that in a two, to, two and a half to five year time frame that it will effectively be a paper agreement and not too much more, I, I think that that is more likely than not. Uh, and, and, you know, th this agreement is sort of focuses on you know, sort of seven core areas that they're trying to develop. And, you know, I, some of those areas I, I know much less about than others, but, you know, they're behind in almost every case. Right? One of them is about educational exchange. They've had a hard time finding people who want to study in China and vice versa. And that was something that the Iranian regime was hoping to get a lot out of, right? To get a lot of Chinese technical know-how and stuff from getting, visiting scholars back and forth. But it turns out that it, neither Iran, Iran is not the most desirable place it seemed for um, Chinese engineers and professors to live and vice versa. Uh, it, it, most of the Iranian engineers in the, or the, the lead engineers in their nuclear program, they went to school in Western Europe in the United States. Like it's not even like North Korea where they went to school in Russia. Like you're talking about a Western educated at top institutions. And the idea that now they're gonna be satisfied or even or want to go to school in China is not, not really realistic. 
I think the regime was trying to paint that as some sort of like, oh, look at this great alternative. Yes, it might be harder, though not impossible. It might be harder to access university education is there. We understand you may not want to stay here, although Iran does have good universities. Look east. Right, that's the name of the policy in general that Iran has uh, at the moment, broadly broadly speaking, right? The look east policy, look east. But that hasn't, it hasn't generated as much traction. You know, one other thing I'm wondering if this will have any impact on these relationships is, is the U.S. attempt to either become more energy independent or switch to green energy be less dependent on oil, will that affect the balance in any way? It's a good question. I, you know, I, I don't know if I know enough about China's alternative energy sources to really have a, a to be confident about the answer. But in the Gulf region, within the GCC at least, less so in the case of Iran. There is not a move away from, excuse me, not a move away from oil by any means, but there is an awareness among all of those states that the oil and natural gas will at some point run out. It's not, it's not, they're not that worried about the politics shifting away from it, but they're not really worried at all about that. But there is like a, like a, an awareness that the oil the demand might decrease, which will bring the price down, but also at some point it will run out. And so they themselves, especially recently Saudi Arabia, have been trying to make their own major investments in alternative energy. And so, and what they're trying to do, and I don't know, frankly, I don't know enough about the science to know whether they'll be successful. They're trying to maintain their level of influence on the global energy market after, you know, look, looking beyond oil and natural gas. They're hoping to be able to be in a similar position, either through that or through their own international investments. Right? So they're going to try and control the sun. <laughs> that, that sort of M MBS would like nothing more than to control the sun. <laughs> That's why Biden wants to block out the sun. <laughs> Not unlike Mr. Burns. Yes, exactly. Did you guys miss that story? Oh, no, I caught that story. Okay. I'm thinking about the sun now. Uh, well, so uh, what would the Middle East look like if you know, the CCP or communist China were just simply not involved anymore? That's a, that's a very interesting question. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind but this sort of betrays my own sort of interests and biases, I think, is it would be in the, not immediate term, but even in the short term, it would be fairly devastating to much of Iran's military capabilities and would dramatically shift the balance of power in the Gulf. I don't mean the Gulf region necessarily, but in like literally in the Persian Gulf to the GCC and, and US, right, our, our partners there. Um, because the IRGCN, the um, uh, Islamic uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy, which has responsibility over the Gulf, over the last 10 years has shifted almost entirely from legacy Norwegian weapons platforms and ships you know, bought under the Shah. It's now almost entirely Chinese made um, fast attack boats, silkworm missiles along the coast, um, you know, and, and other, other such weapons. And those need upkeep. They're pretty often trying to upgrade and replace them. If that were gone, Iranian naval capabilities would be hard, would take a long time for them to build back up. They get a little bit of assistance from North Korea, but their own ability is now just about matched North Korea in that regard. Um, so it, it would, 
change that, which I think would be very beneficial to the US. I think that it would, despite these protests inside Iran, it would be tremendously disruptive to the Iranian economy in an unpredictable way. And by that, I mean, would people blame China for X? I mean, this would depend on why China withdrew from the region. Or would they blame us if it was perceived that we had driven China out and this had caused some sort of economic calamity? That part I'm not sure of. Um, I think that it would make the Saudis and Emiratis in particular, by necessity, be a bit more receptive to US cordial requests about production and in the case of UAE, about doing business with a wide range of, sort of sanctioned actors, not just Chinese. Um, I think it would greatly strengthen the US position almost immediately. My concern, and don't get me wrong, I would love that. What I think if that were to happen, what we would have to be careful of, which is something I think we've seen play out we were seeing play out a little bit before the Russian invasion of Ukraine in Europe, would be, let's say that happened. Then I think it becomes much more tempting in a way for a US president to actually start to withdraw from the region. You start to get um, maybe American citizens going, well, what are we really doing there? Why do we need to be involved at all? Um, I sort of got it when it was about countering China, but I know it. And my concern would be, and again, the context of this obviously would matter, that we would then actually withdraw, and that would allow either a return of China or other bad actors to, to fill in that gap. And so I think that any US administration that was in place at the time of a major Chinese pullback for whatever reason, would really have to do a very good job of messaging to the American public why it was important that the US actually, um, to explain the importance of the Middle East to, to, the, Amer to, to the American to American voters. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. If uh, anyone watching wants to follow you, where should they go? Yeah, you'd think that would be an easy question to answer. But um, historically, I would say you could follow me on Twitter, now X. You're still welcome to do that at the moment to have the account locked, but I'll accept anyone who, who appears to be a real human. Um, I'm still sort of grappling with the Musk situation. Um, I'm not thrilled with doing anything that benefits him, even if it's in a minor way. Um, but you can also, um, and it'll be revamped you know, sometime in, in the next couple of weeks, um, my website, jonathancrystal.com, um, as well, usually has uh, updates on uh, publications, things like that uh, as well. Great. Yeah, thanks for joining us. There was a lot of things that I'd never have thought of before. You're welcome. It's always fun uh, to talk about these issues. They are very complicated, and um, it's good to actually have time to get into them a bit, because the lack of time means that so much of the U.S. media just ignores them. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's. I think it came out pretty clearly in this uh, this interview that things these things are always very complex. Indeed. Thank you. I guess this is the part of the podcast where we go off the rails. But if we don't have oil from the Middle East, the rail, the, the cart won't go anywhere. Okay. Yes. Okay. I thought that, you know, America was essentially energy independent, according to what we just learned in this interview. I was surprised about that because that's always, that's a, that's a big thing in, uh, like, you know, uh, political debates now saying like, oh, you know, the Biden has made us not energy energy. Dependence. Well, energy independence, it depends how you define energy independence. Exactly like if we had an American does, does the, does the U.S. produce as much as we consume? Roughly, yes. But it's not strictly independent because as we've covered on America Uncovered, 
like the a lot of times it's cheaper to export US oil and import refined oil or or crude oil from other countries that we can process in our refineries which are designed for a different type of oil than we produce right. for so, some reason. So even though there might be a, a balance overall, we're still reliant on exports and imports, which I mean, it's kind of crazy when you think about it like we really should just you know, redo our refineries and fix that problem so we're not so dependent on other countries. I remember like earlier this year, I think Biden, or maybe last year when the oil prices were really spiked and Biden was talking about getting oil from, you know, Venezuela. new sources like Venezuela, yeah. uh, which like, I think we work with enough authoritarian regimes to get our oil. We don't need to add more. I mean, but on the other hand, we're really used to working with authoritarian regimes for our, our oil. So, so, so we're good at it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Well, what? Debatable. <laughs> well, well, we're what competent this, at it. What the only thing That's though debatable. is, like, it's going to be harder for the, the China to, for the CCP to do this thing where they're trying to use countries like Iran and Russia and like form this like coalition, right, to kind of hedge themselves against. Um, the U.S. economic system, things like, oh, if we can get other countries to accept RMB, then we don't have to worry as much about getting sanctioned by the U.S. You know, if we were to pull a Russia and invade Taiwan, right. for example. But countries don't really want RMB because RMB is useless unless you're using it to buy stuff from China. Yeah, and but like even in a country that is receptive to like trading more with China, right? Because Iran is already a pariah state, so they are sanctioned from doing trade with a lot of countries. Even that system is not working for Iran and China because now there are domestic tensions within Iran that they don't like the flood of cheap Chinese goods that's coming over the border because it's wrecking their own economy. So will China, will the CCP be able to use like this economic power to shield themselves from U.S. sanctions, it might not be as simple as they are trying to plot out right now. You know, in some ways, China's giving Iran and the U.S. common ground. Which is? Not liking the flood of cheap Chinese good. Right. I mean, interestingly- when... Timu <laughs> interrupts the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's George Sheehan. Yeah, it, interestingly, the Iranian public seems to be more concerned about the issue of cheap Chinese imports than the U.S. public. It's because we lost the manufacturing base like a long 30 time years ago. ago yeah. Versus now, yeah, yeah, yeah. All those people don't have jobs. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, indeed. So we might not even be able to manufacture more rails. To go off to, of. to go off of, yeah. That's why we go off the rails on this show. We don't <laughs> want to be dependent on China for the rails. <laughs> High speed rail. Thank you for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Sally Chang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. We'll see you next time.